all today. Thank you so much for coming um, to our big mini conf. Um, just to introduce myself. Hi, my name is Agnes and I'm Event and Community Manager at Code Chrysalis. If you have not heard of us, then we are a programming bootcamp in Tokyo, helping people change their careers. And we do have courses in both English and Japanese remote and on-site at our office in Roppongi. So please check our website or follow us on our social media. Um, what is a big mini conf? Big mini conf is basically just a bunch of tech talks that our software engineering bootcamp students and graduates do an independent research on the topic that they're really passionate about. Um, and this is something that they do outside of our bootcamp projects. And you can imagine that our, our bootcamp is very, very intensive. So hats off for all of our uh, wonderful speakers today. So without um, delaying, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker today, um, Antonio. And Antonio will be intro, uh, introducing us to the face recognition. Antonio? Okay. Hello. Yes, I'm here. I cannot share screen until... Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an introduction to face recognition with faceapi.js. My name is Antonio Dernaldis. I am a software engineer originally from Italy. I'm also a Code Chrysalis graduate, go CC15. <laughs> I've lived in five different countries, Italy, US, Russia, Jamaica, and right now I'm here in Japan. And whenever I feel homesick or just have some extra spare time, I like to cook and make Italian food. Everything from pasta bread to pizza to homemade sausage. But enough about that. Let's talk about the topics that we'll be covering during this talk. First of all, we'll, the talk will be divided in four parts. We'll be talking about the history, when it started, and how face recognition technology has evolved over time. We'll be talking about faceapi.js. What is it? How does it work? Then we'll be talking and we'll be showcasing a couple of examples, uh, some of the features and how they can be implemented in some real world application. And final, we will have a small recap and a review of the current debate around facial recognition technology. But let's start with history. Take a second and in your mind, try to make a guess about when facial recognition technology started. And then, you know, let's check if you were correct. Now, the history of face recognition starts with this person. Woody Bledsoe. Now, I could have chosen a better picture because of all the scribbles that you see there, but actually those lines are part of the history of facial recognition technology, and we will be talking about them in just a second. Woody Bledsoe was a professor at the University of Texas, he was also one of the founders of AI due to his contribution in pattern recognition technology. In 1960, he funded a company called Panoramic, and the original idea was to try to sell optical character recognition, or OCR, to company. However, it struggled to get off the ground. But in the 60s, at the peak of the Cold War, the US government was actually interested in pushing research and boundaries, especially in the field of computing. So in 1964, he actually worked a contract for the CIA to try to develop facial recognition technology. At this time, he was trying to make it in an entirely automatic manner, but it was not very successful following year, what you're looking at right now, it's actually an excerpt from the CIA history in a document declassified in late 2017. And as we can see in the top here, it mentioned fiscal year 65 or 1965. And it's talking about the development of a man-machine system for facial recognition. Now, for the sci-fi fans out there, man-machine has nothing to do with cyborg, but actually has to do with those lines in the picture that I showed a second ago. It's a man-machine system because the pictures had to be manually annotated. And this is actually a breaking point in the research of facial recognition technology because it shifts the focus from trying to full match a face and a picture to just focusing on features, the distance between them and their proportion. And that's why you had seen those lines earlier. Well, this was definitely a significant improvement previous compared to the previous technology that was being used. The system still struggled a lot with issues like facial hair and aging. 
keep us in mind that we're talking about the 60s and technologies was a little bit behind from what we have today. And the pixel values could only range between zero and four while doing this analysis. Now, in 1965, he was tired of juggling between too many contracts and too few. On recommendation of a friend, he joined the University of Texas. However, in 1967, he took on one last job for the CIA, and that was to develop a system that could do face recognition for mug, using mugshots. Before, this all was done manually, and they actually had trained individuals that go through massive binders, page by page, try to match pictures and suspect. And a fully trained individual could do this in a three or four hour time frame. Now, what Bledsoe was able to do at the time was to create a machine that could do that in only three minutes. However, it is unlikely that it will be able to know more about his work. In 1995, while under effect of a degenerative disease, a few months before his death, he ordered his son to burn his personal archive. So there are no longer any records about his progress in the facial recognition technology. But a few years later, on the other side of the Pacific in 1973, Japanese computer scientist Takeo Kaneda made the next major leap in facial recognition technology using a database of 850 digitized photos of people taken during the 1970 World Fair in Suita, Japan, he wrote a program that was able to extract facial features such as nose, mouth, eyes, without any human input. He achieved what was Bledsoe's dream of removing the man from the man-machine system. And then that takes us within the last 10 years. According to Anil Jain, co-editor of Handbook of Face Recognition, Pretty much in the last 10 years, nearly all the obstacles that Bledsoe was facing have been removed. First of all, the supply of digital pictures nowadays is limitless. I mean, let's look at Facebook. The advance in machine learning algorithm, storage capacity and processing power. Right now, computers are essentially self-teaching. Given a few basic rules, they can now pattern match pretty much everything from faces to labeling and identifying different packets of instant ramen. But enough of the history. Let's move on to the real reason why you're here. Let's talk about Face API to JS. What is Face API to JS? It's a JavaScript API for face detection, face recognition, and face landmark detection built using TensorFlow to JS. Now, Face API to JS comes with four models bundled in. For those that are not familiar with what a model is, think of them in this case as functionality or features that are coming included with face API to JS, and we have four of them. The first one is the detection one. Its main purpose is to detect if there are faces or not in any given picture or video frame. The following one is the recognition. It identifies a face if a face is the same one as another one that we're giving it for comparison. Then we have expression that tries to determine the expression of the person in the given frame or image, and then age and gender where we're trying to infer age and gender of the face that is being identified. During the example later, we will be focusing toward the last two models. But for a little bit more in-depth look, let's talk about the face detection models. We actually have two models here. One of them is the SSD mobile net or single shot multi-box detector. What this model does is it's, it's been trained using the wider face data set and looks through an image or a frame and tries to identify if there are faces. And if so, where are they located? This model focuses more on accuracy over speed. And in fact, its model size is a little bit on the heavier side, weighing around 5.4 megabyte. The other model, however, that comes bundled with it, in case, to just to cover all of your bases, is the tiny face detector. It's very performant, real-time face detector. It's fast. Slightly less accurate, especially with small faces, but the model size is only 190 kilobyte. That is about 20 times smaller, and this should be your go-to option for web development or memory-limited devices. Now, talking about the face recognition models, it's used to recognize if a face is the same as a provided one. It is not limited to a training data set. That means that because a lot of pictures were given to it while it was training to identify a face, you can give it your picture that was not in training model and it's still able to identify if that person is you, if you're providing uh, comparison pictures. 
It uses a feature vector of over 128 values. To compare it, the Bledsoe model used only 22. The model size is 6.2 megabyte, and it has an accuracy in the label face in the wild benchmark for face recognition of 99.38%. Face expression recognition model. It's a light wave, it's fast, and provides a reasonable accuracy. The quantized model size is about 310 kilobyte. And however, due to expression changing the way that features are displaced on the face, something as simple as wearing glasses or facial hair might decrease the accuracy. So now let's talk about one of the more interesting ones, the age and gender recognition model. It is a so-called multitask network that has three layers, one that works on extracting the features, one on age regression, regression, and another one as a gender classifier. It was trained on eight different databases using an 80-20 split. Now, an 80-20 split trained test means that if we have a database of 100 pictures, we put 80 in the training folder, the algorithm will go through them and we'll try to learn and identify them. Then we have another 20 pictures, we're putting them in a test folder, and of all these pictures, we already know the age and the gender of the person. And then we test if the machine learning algorithm is able to identify them correctly. Now, some of the conclusions we can see here, there's a small table at the bottom, as you can see. We actually have that between age of zero and three, it's extremely precise for age with only a median age error of one of a year and a half. And However, like as we get on the other side of the spectrum, if the person is over 80 years old, the average error could be almost 10 years. The gender recognition model, however, it, while extremely imprecise with only a 69% uh, rate in the age group between zero and three years old, that keeps increasing until it approaches 90% in the group age between nine to 18 years old. And from 19 onward, the success rate is over 90%, actually averaging about 96. But let's move on to the examples. Let's start by talking about expression recognition. As you can see, this is how it would look like if you're doing something using Face API. We'll draw the boundary box and we'll label and telling you if it's happy or a neutral expression. Now, how do you do that? Let's talk about the implementation. Now, first of all, most of this code run, it will involve reading of a file, either the model or an image source. So it is, uh, it is an asynchronous operation. Now, our first step will have to be to load, as you can see, faceapi.nets.sstmobile.net v1, load from URI. So we're loading our mobile net <clears throat> model to be able to detect faces in the image. But as we can see, as we said earlier, this is a little bit more heavier, so not ideal for web development, but could still be used for that purpose. And this should always be your step one, because the first step is that you need to be able to identify faces in the picture. Now, the second one will load the landmark feature, landmark 68, to recognize features, their location, and tracking them as they change, if it is the case of a video. And this, again, should always be your second step. Then the third one would be loading whatever model you want to load next, in this case, we're talking about expression, so we're loading that one. Now, part two of how we are going to implement this is just simply to just tell it to detect. So we initialize our detection variable, tell it to await, face API or detect all faces, and here is where we provide our sources. In this case, it's an image, but it could be a video. We say that we want to do face landmark and we want the expression. Afterward, the last step of the implementation and these can be optional, depending on if you want to display your result on the picture itself or on the video. So in this case, we're drawing the boundary box on the faces as draw detection, draw face landmark, we'll draw and identify the facial features and expression, we'll label the picture and will tell us if it's happy or sad, but let's look at the results. Neutral, happy, sad, and surprised. There we have it, evidence of proof that Mark Zuckerberg, it's not a robot, or at least, his AI has updated to have at least four states of emotion. But jokes aside, let's take a look about some real life application. And we're gonna be talking about autism and prosopagnosia. Prosopagnosia is a neurological disorder characterized by the inability to recognize faces. It can range from no face recognition to not even your own face to being able to read emotion of someone's face. 
talking about autism, on the other hand, according to the National Institute of Health, by five or seven years of age, many autistic children can recognize happy and sad, but they have a harder time with more subtle expression like fear and anger. By adolescence, autistic teenagers still aren't as good at recognizing fear, anger, surprise, and disgust as typical teenagers do. And as adults, some of this problem can still continue. Now, using augmented reality, it is possible to develop a heads-up display to help them better navigate human-to-human -human interaction. Anybody remembers the Google Glasses? They'd be a perfect example for a possible use that could be done. And actually, a similar solution is currently under development by some universities. And this is what I'm trying to get you to think about. We've been familiarized by media and TVs and movies of using face recognition to, for security reason. Think of face recognition and its possibility of using it as an accessibility tool. Now, let's talk about second example, age prediction. This is Vincent, he's actually the main developer behind faceapi.js. How do we implement our age and gender? As you can see, it's a pretty similar steps to the one that we've taken before, where we have our step one, we're loading the SSD mobile net. And again, if we were to worry about some memory constraint, we could switch this to the tiny face detector. Then we do the face landmark to again, identify features. Face expression, in this case, uh, it's just, it was providing the example and I kept it as close to the original as possible. And we're loading the age gender. Following step once more is to detect given our sources. So we're waiting face API to detect all faces. In this case, as you can see, it's a video of the source that's been given. That is because you can provide either face landmark again, face expression and age and gender. And all of these values here will be stored as a tuple. Last but not least, we're talking about, again, drawing those boundary boxes that we've seen earlier the same thing we're saying, draw detection, draw face landmark, and draw the face expression. And as we can see again, part of what we've seen earlier, we have Vincent that says he's 24 years old, male, surprised. And as we can see, as the frame changes, also the age prediction changes a little bit. Now, about real life application, and we're talking about identifying child soldiers. Now, full disclosure, this project actually was developed using Python and OpenCV. But the underlying technology is the same. Here we have two models, one of which is looking for camouflage or military fatigue, and the second tries to predict age and marks a target that match both profile. I mean, I'm not going to talk about its possible use for content moderation, as we hear about every day, but this is a tool that could be used as an early warning sign in conflict or unstable regions to, aware, to make us aware if there are human rights violations that are starting. Now let's talk about a little bit of recap and conclusion. Now, facial recognition is a truly fascinating technology. It has become more reachable, and as we saw, it can be implemented with relatively ease. It was just nine lines of code. I'm excited as a user to see like which way I can use it, but I'm even more excited as a developer to see what I can do with it, and especially because it's within my reach without a paywall, and it does no longer require any heavy-duty specialized hardware. But the dialogue about it, it's still complicated. And we'll be talking about that now for a couple of minutes. Let's talk about the cons of facial recognition because these ones are pretty big. First of all, bias. Last year, a test of Amazon recognition software misidentified 28 NFL players as criminals. In 2019, a report from the US National Institute of Standards and Technology which tested code for more than 50 different developers of facial recognition software found that uh, white males are less falsely matched with mugshot than any other age, uh, gender, and race group. It enables targeting. Bledsoe himself at some point pitched the idea to DARPA to develop a system that could do face recognition based on race. And as we already seen it, the models are already discriminatory per se. It also makes it extremely easy to target an individual or a minority. And as again, we've seen it, it just takes nine lines of code. Now, in 2018, a pair of academics wrote a broadside against the field saying that they believe that facial recognition technology 
is the most uniquely dangerous surveillance mechanism ever invented. Part of the biggest problem, it's also the privacy and the Internet of Things. I mean, we've all read the scary article about ring doorbells being hacked, people talking through your nanny cams. Privacy, it's extremely important. And facial recognition, let's face it, it is a threat to it. But there are also some pros. I mean, let's look at this picture. It's a picture taken at Narita Airport. It's extremely convenient because if you're a person with a Japanese passport, you just put it on the machine, scan it, it allows it to take your picture. It matches that it's you and there you go, you're home. Like, no more waiting a long time in line at the booth to get in back home. You just scan and breeze through home. Now, it also it's, makes for a simpler life. We heard about you know Windows Hello and Apple Face ID. They're advertised as convenient, but look at them also from the point of an accessibility. These tools can help people with um, motion disability overcome those issues. For security, let's face it, it is undeniable that it can be used for that purpose. It can be used for criminals, but it can also be used for identifying missing children. And now, after we said all this, I just want to leave you guys with one last quote, final reflection. This is a quote from Albert Einstein. It says, technological progress is like an ax in the hand of a pathological criminal. Facial recognition is here to stay. It's as easy to do good with it as it is to do bad. As a user and developers, it's our choice which path this technology will take. So now that you've seen it, take facial recognition technology, go out there and do good with it. Thank you. Very much for this talk. My name is Antonio Dernaldis. Please feel free to contact me. You have my Twitter, my LinkedIn, and my GitHub here. You also have a QR code with the link to the Face API JS GitHub repository. Thank you very much for, to Code Crystalis as well for hosting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonia. That was really wonderful. Um, definitely. Um, face recognition is a very impressive technology, but thank you for reminding us that there are some um, points about it that we need to be careful about. Um, thank you so much again, Antonio. Um, so our next talk starts from half past one. Um, and our speaker is Dominic, and he will be talking about how machine learning is influencing games. So please stay tuned. We are going to start soon.
Hello, everyone, again. Um, we are ready to welcome our next speaker, Dominique. Um, Dominique loves exploring new technologies and he enjoys many types of games, such as video games, board games, and card games. And today he will be talking about how machine learning is influencing games. So a big applause for Dominic and welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so yeah, hello internet. Uh, my name is Dominic. And today we're gonna to talk about machine learning and more specifically machine learning in games. Uh, but before that, just a little bit about myself. So yeah, I'm a developer and student here at Code Chrysalis and I like exploring new technologies. Uh, recently, I've been messing with uh, Godot Engine and GDScript for creating 2D games. Uh, and I enjoy playing games a lot, uh, especially competitive games at a high level. Uh, I got started with competitive games back in like Halo 2 and Halo 3 days on Xbox. But I've played a variety of titles from Halo to Pokemon, League of Legends, fighter games like Tekken, uh, a lot of card games. So Hearthstone, Magic the Gathering, Gwent, Legends of Runeterra. If there's a card game, I've probably at least heard about it. And I'm interested in seeing if these games can be solved or how they can be solved. Like, is there a best way to play a certain game? So in my talk today, I'm gonna touch upon reinforcement learning, uh, just kind of the whole process and then how that process can be used in games. Uh, Alpha Zero and Mu Zero. And these are like some of the greatest achievements in the field of RL when we're talking about games. And then reinforcement learning just kind of going forward. So uh, before we talk about uh, reinforcement learning, we should probably talk about machine learning a little bit. Um, so machine learning is just a part of artificial intelligence that attempts to provide systems with the ability to just learn and improve on their own. Um, so I put a picture of GLaDOS, if you're familiar with the portal games, uh, GLaDOS has control over this facility where she has her, her subjects, uh, completing or failing, uh, puzzles that she created. And she learns from the, what the subjects are doing with their puzzles to make better puzzles. Uh, maybe a more real world example of that would be something like email filtering or image recognition. So these things are done through supervised learning. So they're taught by example. Uh, so the general process for that would be something like uh, you gather a labeled data set. So maybe for image recognition, let's say uh, you wanna recognize fruits. So you'd have like a bunch of pictures of apples labeled apple or a bunch of pictures of grapes labeled grape, something like that. And then you would give this data set to the machine learning model to train on. So once you've given it the sample data, you can try to give it data that's not in the data set, like a, another picture of an apple does it that it hasn't seen yet. And the idea is that the model will return a prediction to you, uh, hopefully is right. But then like, if it's not right, like if they don't say it's an apple, you can indicate that prediction was right or wrong. And then uh, the model can learn from that experience until it gets to a point where it will always give the right prediction. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about reinforcement learning, which works a little bit differently from that. So uh, yeah, so reinforcement learning uh, is a part of machine learning, but it focuses on how an agent should take actions in a certain environment to maximize its reward. And we'll look into reward maximization a little bit later. Uh, this is particularly useful in the world of games because in games, some type of reward system already exists. Like a, it's very common in games where if you win, it's good. And if you lose, it's bad. And they learn more through experience. Um, the learning is done through exploring the environment and learning different things about it. This is just kind of like a diagram of the whole reinforcement learning process. So you have the agent. The agent is basically the brains of the whole thing. 
and the agent will decide to take a certain action in the environment. And after the agent has taken the action, the environment will then enter a new state. It'll return a new state and return a new reward for the agent to basically see like the outcome of that action that was taken. And then with this new state and reward, the agent can continue to make another action with that new information. And this process would continue until some terminal or end state uh, is reached. And we'll look into each one of these pieces of reinforcement learning a little bit more deeper. So yeah, so the agent and the action. So like we said, the agent wants to maximize the reward gained from the environment. And that's basically its main goal. Um, you have some reward structure and it wants to keep uh, finding ways to get more and more positive rewards. Uh, future rewards, we usually say are a little, not as much, they're worth less because there might be some uncertainty. Like we might not know, for example, when the terminal state uh, is going to happen. And at each step, this agent will just take an action and then observe the new state and reward from the environment and just keep on doing this process. And while it's doing this process, it's learning. So an agent is usually learning one of these things. So the policy, uh, the agent's decision-making process, the way that it comes up with the actions it wants to take, um, it could be learning to make this just better and better over time to where it's taking better and better actions. Uh, the value function, so how good is each state and or action pair? So uh, like you can look at a state and say, is this a good state no matter what? Or we can look at a state combined with a certain action and saying, okay, is this a good state because I took this action or vice versa? Is this a good action uh, from a certain state? Or the agent could be learning a model which is just the agent's representation or like perspective of the environment. And there's different uh, factors we have to keep in mind when we're talking about the environment. Uh, so for example, is our environment deterministic or stochastic? Uh, deterministic would be something like chess, like some sort of board game where we know all the possible permutations that can be on the board beforehand. Or is it something more stochastic that has some more like randomness involved in it? Uh, fully observable versus versus a uh, partially observable. So can we observe everything uh, about our environment? Uh, just going back to chess, we can observe all the pieces. We know how the pieces move. They're not just going to randomly move in some certain way because we don't know something. Or is it partially observable? Um, kind of like our universe and how we interact or observe our universe. Uh, we only see certain parts of it. Uh, static versus dynamic. Uh, how many things are influencing your environment? Like if it's just you, it may be a more static environment. If you have multiple different things influencing the environment, it could be more dynamic and you have to take these into account. And this kind of ties into the number of agents. If you have multiple agents influencing your environment, that's something you take into account probably be more dynamic thing. Uh, a good general way to look at static versus dynamic is like you can think static more maybe like a single player type games where dynamic may be more multiplayer type games. And then we have the state and the reward. So these are the observable results of whatever action you take in the environment. So the state contains all the necessary information you need to make that next move. So like uh, the state of a tic-tac-toe board or something like that. And the reward is any points that you've gained or lost from taking that certain action. And in games, the most general uh, reward system is you get points for winning and you lost points for losing. So the agent would obviously try to win to the best of his capabilities. Uh, so I think it's a good time to look at a couple different examples of this whole process. So one that's very common in reinforcement learning to talk about games is cart pull. So the general idea of cart pull is uh, you have a, po a pole and then you have a moving cart uh, that it's on. And your only goal is to balance the pole on the moving cart so it's upright. 
Uh, so the environment uh, for this problem, uh, it depends. It could be a simulation, like the like the GIF shown, or maybe it's in reality. Like maybe you're setting all this stuff up uh, in the real world, and you might have to account for certain forces that you can control better in your simulation. Uh, the state, uh, which is the things that you observe after you've taken your action. So this can be things like the pole angle or the speed of it or the position of the cart, uh, the forces acting on the cart, speed of the cart, things like that. Uh, the actions. So in this case, you don't have many actions to take. You can only apply some sort of horizontal force to the cart, and that's it. And then the reward. Uh, you can just do some something simple like uh, plus. You get some plus points if the pole is upright um, at a certain time step, something like that. So this is a more general uh, reinforcement learning uh, problem. Uh, so what about something like Pokemon, like a video game? Uh, so in Pokemon, uh, the goal is already set, set out for you to defeat the opponent in battle, uh, but we talk about the environment, we have to think about, so where is this battle actually taking place? Um, is, it, is it a simulator? Is it on the actual game cartridge? Or when we're talking about in the actual game, where in the game is it taking place? Because then we have to think about, um, is it in a rainy area? Is it in a area that like, has a sandstorm or if it's sunny, uh, certain like weather effects, things like that. Uh, the state of the game. Uh, this is where it starts getting a little tricky because there's a lot of different information. Uh, there's a lot of different information that's available to you at once. So like the state of the Pokemon on your team, the state of the Pokemon on the opponent's team, which you might not know the full state of, uh, certain field conditions on that are going on, et cetera, like uh, what turn it is. There, there's a lot of stuff going in there uh, that you can observe. Uh, the actions, uh, generally speaking, you can categorize them into two actions like uh, attack with your current Pokemon, but then your current Pokemon has a list of moves. So each one of those can be seen as a different action or switch uh, the different Pokemon in your party. And the reward, uh, in the game sense, we could keep it simple and say you uh, get reward if you win and you lose, you don't get any reward, you get negative reward uh, if you lose. Um, but you could have something more complex where it's like uh, you gain a smaller reward if you knock out a Pokemon, or an even smaller one if you do some damage to one, or and same thing for the negative ones. You you can lose a smaller amount if you lose a Pokemon. Um, so the reward system can get a lot more complex. When we're talking about something like Pokemon compared to Heartbolt. So then, what about human life? Because uh, humans also participate in this reinforcement learning process. Uh, so our goals, they're not as defined as the games that we play. In, in the game of life, people have different goals, like happiness, security, survival. Uh, there's, there's plenty of different uh, goals out there. Peace, our environment, uh, the universe, partially observable uh, for all we know. Uh, there, there are things that we just can't observe uh, in the universe at our current time. Uh, the state is our observations of the universe through our senses. Our senses are the way that we can interact or observe our universe. And the different types of actions we can take. Um, we can say something or do something, think something. And these, this something feels like potentially like infinite possibilities. So we have a really large action space. And the reward um who knows uh us individuals we could all have like separate rewards for ourselves that we consciously or subconsciously create or there can be rewards that society has put in place for us like in general speaking terms we say it's like a good thing to get a good education or have a good job or things like that okay so now we looked at reinforcement reinforcement learning a little bit um, let's jump into some of the giants in reinforcement learning. We're talking about games with Alpha Zero and Mu Zero. Um, these are agents that are created by DeepMind. Um, 
and they utilize neural networks, uh, which we're not going to touch upon too much, but just know that um, neural networks are like, that's part of the agent. It, it helps the agent decide uh, what action to make. So it's their brain. So AlphaGo, which is the predecessor to AlphaZero, um, which was made for Go, which is a board game. Be 18 time world champion Lisa Dahl in a best of five Go match. Uh, pretty impressive. Um, but it was able to do this by playing itself over and over, uh, which is an interesting way of like kind of speeding up the process of being good. I mean, because you're, you're, you're constantly kind of playing against someone that's uh, doing the same thing you're doing. So you're both uh, bettering each other. Now, the only key thing to note here is that it was fed huge data sets of professional games and like pre-computed move tables to help decide the decision making process a little bit uh, beforehand. But if we compare that to Alpha Zero, uh, which is similar to Alpha Go, um, but it didn't need any of that. It was only given just the rules of chess. And with only the rules of chess, it was able to outperform Stockfish, which is one of the best uh, chess engines out there, after only playing it for four hours. And before those four hours, it only self played or self trained for nine hours. So, like, in 13 hours, it was able to beat, go from nothing to beating a state-of-the-art chess engine. And just to kind of put that into perspective, uh, the youngest person to achieve grandmaster status in chess did so at about 12 years old. So what a human needed 12 years to do, uh, Alpha Zero needed 12, 13 hours to do. And it almost thinks in a more human-like way. Uh, compared to other chess engines. Uh, so it uses something called the Monte Carlo tree search, which is just a, a tree exploration method to balance uh, exploring certain paths or exploiting certain paths. Uh, exploiting means uh, traversing farther in promising states that you've already uh, explored before because you know these states are gonna lead to something good. Whereas exploring is just uh, the opposite, going down paths that you haven't really explored before uh, and you don't really know uh, what to expect going down there. And we have this uh, chart that shows the amount of uh, moves that these things look into before they make a decision. So a state-of-the-art chess engine looks into millions and millions of different moves before it makes a decision. Uh, compared that to a human grandmaster, they only make hundreds of moves or look hundreds of moves before they make a decision. And Alpha Zero fits somewhere in between. It doesn't need to look at every permutation of the board possible to know uh, it's going to make a good move. So it's almost like it has a sense of intuition as to what move it's going to make. Yeah, so with these chess engines, uh, players are now able to strategize game plans at a higher level. And they can come up with these very deep theoretical lines of play uh, to play against other humans with. And they can also review their games uh, using engines, uh, with like an evaluation system to see different game states and what the engine has to say about that game state. And that can also lead to lots of draws, though, because as these players are getting better uh, and learning from these engines, uh, we see uh, AlphaZero versus Stockfish, which is uh, the two engines playing against each other. Most of their games resulted in a draw. So this just kind of shows like at the highest level of play in chess, um, you're going to be getting a lot of draws. So that takes us to Mu Zero, which comes after Alpha Zero. Very similar, but now we don't even need the rules of the game anymore. Um, it, develop, it learns the rules uh, through experience. It develops a model that has its own interpretation of the rules. Um, so this means it's not limited to board games like AlphaGo and AlphaZero. And it was able to beat uh, 57 different Atari games through reconstructing the state of the pixels. So we notice you have like the original image that goes through some encoding the coding process and out comes some reconstructed image or its interpretation of that original image. They're not exactly the same, but for Mu0, it's enough to beat these games. Uh, so that leaves the question of like, what else can something like Mu0 do? What else can it conquer? 
So going forward with RL, uh, before we look at mu zero again, uh, let's look at alpha star. I think this is another important thing to talk about. So alpha star was, it entered the world of esports. So we saw alpha go and alpha zero, they kind of stuck to traditional classical board games. But alpha star entered the world of esports and it was the first AI to defeat a StarCraft II pro and a pretty good one. And there's a lot of challenges that come with trying to tackle a game like StarCraft. Uh, StarCraft in the general sense is you just, you, you build a base and you destroy your opponent's base in the most general sense. Um, but there's a lot of challenges that are involved with this. Uh, first, the game theory itself. So uh, StarCraft is the type of game where we don't know if there's a single best st strategy or not yet. Uh, so the AI needs to constantly explore uh, different strategies to see what it can come up with given the, the current game. Uh, it also has to play with imperfect information. So compared to games like chess, and go where every possible board state is known. Uh, there's fog of war in StarCraft, so things are sometimes unknown. So the AI needs to know when to like scout to get more information or where it needs to just make a decision even though it has imperfect information. Uh, the game is real-time. So it's not a turn-based game like classical board games. Uh, both players are performing uh, actions at the same time at a high rate. So the agent has to continuously uh, have a stream of efficient actions. Uh, we call this APM or actions per minute. And then the action space. Uh, the action space is huge. Like in cart pull, you can't really do, you don't have too many options. But in StarCraft, you can be controlling hundreds of different units at a time. So being uh, able to know which action to take uh, becomes more difficult. But even with all these challenges, Alpha Star was still able to defeat uh, professional StarCraft 2 pros. So that leads to the question of, what about other esports? Like we have Hearthstone, so we have card games, we have League of Legends, so like MOBA, multiplayer online type games, CSGO, so like shooting games. Uh, can all of them be solved? Can all esports be solved? Um, will Mu Zero be like the beginning of solving these types of games? Because Mu Zero doesn't need to necessarily know the rules of the game beforehand. Or we just looked at Alpha Star. Can AlphaStar's process of how it uh, was able to defeat pros, can that be generalized so that other game titles can utilize that? And this kind of leads to the whole topic of man versus machine. So right now we see in chess that players are basically learning from these AI. They're learning from the machine. So could esports also fall in line with this? Are they just gonna, are we just gonna have AI that just dominate every game? And the players just try to like catch up to the AI's level, but they still play against humans? Or can we even reach a point where we learn enough from the AI so that we as humans can beat them? Or if we or even if we can beat them, can we create even stronger AI after we catch up? Or will we just admit that we created something that's just better than us? And that's kind of the end of it. Uh, that's just some food for thought. Uh, these things I find very interesting. And I don't think there's any clear answer right now. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks for watching. Uh, you can find me on GitHub at Tokyo Dom or email me tokyodom1 at outlook.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. That was really wonderful. That was very educational. Thank you so much. Um, our next talk um, will start from um, two. Um, so um, before I introduce our next uh, speaker, I would just like to mention that this is um, track B of today's Tech Talks. We're also running a track a, so please definitely check um, the track A talks. They are very, very interesting. Um, and our next talk um, starts from two, as I mentioned before. Um, Jay will be talking about democratizing machine learning. So we're having another talk about machine learning. So please stay tuned and we are going to start in five minutes.
Hello, hello. We are back with our third talk. Um, let me introduce Jay. And fun fact about Jay is that if he's not doing anything tech related, he's probably somewhere there adoring some golden red rivers. But today Jay is in his tech mode and he will take our lovely audience um, through a demo of prototype of one of his childhood dreams. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he will do a live machine learning training demo. So welcome Jay. Hi, Agnes. How are you doing? Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. Is my, uh, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen now. Is that OK, Agnes? Yes, please. All right. Okay, so I, okay. Okay, so I think. Yes, perfect. Cool. Awesome. Cool. Awesome. OK, so I'm ready to go. Uh, um, can I start? Yes, please. Sure. So hello, everybody, and welcome to Democratizing Machine Learning. Um, I think you can kind of sense a little bit of a theme here, uh, and I hope that this is a fun presentation for you. Uh, some of the things that I want to go over today is just a quick introduction about who I am, uh, a demonstration of the application I made uh, in order to demonstrate machine learning. Uh, a machine learning model that I trained uh, and I spent the last couple of weeks working with. Um, a little bit about machine learning 101 uh, and how it's applicable in the real world and then some closing words. Um, I know that you guys have probably seen a couple of presentations on machine learning uh, by now. Um, and it's amazing what machine learning can do. Uh, so I hope that the point of this presentation isn't to scare you away from machine learning or to put it in some ivory tower, but rather um, that with the tools that we have nowadays um, and, the, and every, the tools that we get every single day going forward, um, that it becomes more accessible for even, even people who are just getting interested in programming and, and machine learning to start unlocking some of the power behind machine learning. So. Uh, to start, let's play. Hmm. Hello, and welcome to the world, wonderful world of machine learning. Machine learning is a part of our daily lives. No longer is it something of sci-fi. Machine learning models come in many forms. Surprisingly, you don't need to be a professor like me to begin to unlock their potential. The first developer, what is your name? J A Y. Wonderful. J, nice to meet you. Here is your trainer card. So allow me to do a formal introduction of myself, and I hope you enjoyed that fun little introduction. Uh, my name is Jay. Uh, I'm, a mem I'm a graduate of CC15. Uh, I'm 28 years old. Uh, currently, I'm a software developer based in Tokyo. Uh, I'm just starting out, so I have zero out of 14 badges. Yeah, for all those of us who started with the original series, there are 114 badges now. Uh, and also, I've caught zero out of 893 Pokemon. Uh, I don't like Golden Retrievers. I think that's a typo. Uh, I love Golden Retrievers. <laughs> um, and so a little bit more about me. Um, being a kid in the 90s, uh, there were a lot of things that I wanted to be and things that I wanted. Uh, one of those was being an X-Wing fighter pilot. Um, I'm sure you remember that summer where they were releasing the Star Wars movies again. Um, I wanted a pet T-Rex to chase away my bullies. Um, and I loved animals. And by, by relation, I fell in love with Pokemon, just the dichotomy and the colorful world that the artists put together and gave like a, an ecosystem of these these fictional animals that all had like their own habitats. Um, and one thing from the show that I really wanted, I really, really wanted was a Pokedex. Um, and at the time, this was back in the nineties, this was a little bit of like an obscure thing. You know, we still had like those really old weird flip phones. Um, smartphones were, you know, nowhere to be heard of at the time. Um, and so, 
I thought that this was a, just going to be another, uh, another fantasy for a while. Um, and until today, uh, and I'd like to show you a demo of my Pokédex 1.0. So, this is the main screen. Um, I, uh, the center, in the center you'll see here um, is just a button, uh, like a large button. So if I push it down, uh, it activates. Uh, and usually this would be tied to the, to the smartphone's camera. Um, and uh, I intended for the users to, the user audience to actually be young children. Um, I wanted to have a friendly UI so that they can go around and take pictures of Pokemon uh, and then almost pretend like they were living out the cartoons that they enjoy watching. So let's, let's imagine that this is actually um, using the camera of the phone uh, since I'm using an emulator, I can't actually use my webcam to take a picture of myself. Although maybe I'd be a Venusaur. Um, so, hmm, I clicked on Venusaur, but for some reason it gave me Ivysaur. Uh, that's one of the problems with the machine learning model that I trained, and I'll get a little bit more into that uh, in a little bit. Let's try, let's try picking Venusaur again. Okay, so now, now we got Venusaur. Um, and as you can see, I selected an image and from somewhere, it's pulling this data uh, from the internet and it's rendering onto my application. Um, but the image that I chose isn't the exact same image as what's being displayed here. So how does it know that I want Venusaur? Um, let's choose a different Pokemon. Uh, let's go with Blastoise. I think Blastoise is pretty cool. Hmm, okay. So again, we're getting a different, Im we're getting an animated image uh, when we're initially choosing a um, static image. And where is that information coming from? Uh, if we look back really quick, um, none of the, the, the photo name isn't really giving us much in information about which Pokemon we're looking for. Um, and that leads me into, uh, I want to introduce to you uh, the, the way that the data is flowing into my application. So, uh, starting from the left and going to the right, uh, we take a picture of a Pokemon. Uh, and that information travels to a machine learning model that I trained specifically for this purpose. Um, it's getting processed. And there's an HTTP GET request being sent out to this third party um, open source RESTful API called Poke API. Uh, and I'm getting information back from them in the form of a JSON. And getting resources back, which I like to call the Pokey payload. Um, and that's coming back. And I'm using that information to render onto the front end of my application um, in somewhat of a similar fashion as what you saw in the, uh, in the presentation. Uh, and how is it doing that? Um, and so I mentioned that I trained it a machine learning model. And I want to introduce you to uh, IBO 1.0. Um, and it's a, <laughs> it's a play on words. Um, for those of you who know CC15, we love our puns. Um, and it's a play on words of the words AI, artificial intelligence, and bot, uh, but also um, a Japanese word, aibo, which is maybe similar to like a partner or like a, an accomplice. Uh, and for the last couple of weeks in developing this application, um, aibo was really my aibo. Uh, pretty cute, isn't he? <laughs> um, You'll notice that he's still in um, his 1.0 version. Um, and the reason for that is because in order to train a machine learning model to be incredibly efficient and accurate, uh, it requires a large amount of data set, which uh, me individually with the time constraints that I had, uh, it would be very difficult to. Um, and so to get into how I trained the machine learning model up until this point, uh, well, it started with an inception. It started with a lot of training and a lot of great wins. <laughs> I'm just kidding. This is not how you train a machine learning model. Um, this is how you fool around with Google Slides. Now, how I really trained Ivo is it involved 1,500 images. And these are 1,500 images of the original 150 Pokemon. Uh, and my computer folder looks like this. 
Um, this is what I spent most of my Christmas Eve and Christmas doing. Um, and a lot of confidence calibration. Um, as you know, there are some Pokemon that look very similar to each other. Uh, a good example is Diglett and Dugtrio. Um, but this new Diglett and Dugtrio is a little, little sketchy, I guess. Um, and there's only so much that you can do with the data set that you have. Each Pokemon was only fed 10 images. The average machine learning model requires about like thousands of images for each class. But hey, it's, it, uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing how Ibo can grow uh, in his next iterations. Um, and so a little bit about how Ibo was made further. Um, I, want to, I need to introduce you to uh, Google Teachable Machine. And this is where the democratization of machine learning, the topic of this presentation uh, is really coming in. Um, so Google Teachable Machine is an open source uh, free platform developed by Google. Uh, and it features TensorFlow models, uh, pre-trained machine learning models that you can set up fairly quickly. Um, you can train fairly quickly uh, with a very user-friendly UI. Um, you can download the model and then you can implement it into your projects, whether that's in Python uh, or in my case, I developed it in uh, Dart and Flutter uh, just for a very quick uh, proof of concept. Uh, so the pre-trained model that I used for the Pokemon Pokedex was actually the uh, image project. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about how that looks in just a second uh, with a second demo. <laughs> and so if you can see my screen, um, this is the interface for training a uh, image recognition uh, model, a pre-trained model. Um, in a uh, teachable machine um, from going from left, uh, from left to right again. Uh, you can see that I have these three groups, uh, Pidgeotto, Pidgeot, uh, and Butterfree. Uh, and it looks like they're all flying Pokemon. Um, if you'll notice that Pidgeotto and Pidgeot look quite similar to one another. Um, and this is one of the things that I wanna highlight to you in terms of the how the how the machine learning model will perceive confidence when it's comparing two different things. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that uh, the formal term for these are actually classes. Um, so Pidgeotto, Pidgeot, and Butterfree are all separate classes of each other. Um, the photos that we've up, that I've uploaded here uh, they are the training data. Um, and so uh, the next portion of the machine learning model is actually to train the model. So um, an algorithm runs under the hood uh, that feeds these images to the machine learning model um, and is using deep, deep learning neural networks in order to pick out these patterns or these color palettes, the sizes, the stances, the poses, um, any distinct feature they can find and find consistency across on uh, in order to say with better confidence that, yep, this is, uh, that this is a Pidgeotto and this is a Pidgeot. Uh, so let's do a little bit of an experiment here. Um, this is your preview screen. Uh, and so you have a couple options here. Uh, you can either use a webcam to feed uh, a test to the machine learning model, uh, or you can just use a file. Um, for the purpose of the presentation, because I think that it's going to think that I look maybe like a Pidgeot because of my crazy hair, uh, let's just go with a file. Uh, and so. I have a couple of pictures here in my, hmm. It doesn't look like this picture has been given to the model yet. So I'm going to give it just as a test and let's see what the machine learning model thinks. So there's a picture that I've staged and it's interesting. This is actually a Pidgeot, but it looks like it's considering this as a Pidgeotto. Um, and that's, that's some of the difficulties that I was having with this uh, machine learning model is the lack of images that I was finding that were unique from one another in order to really flesh out um, the abilities of, uh, of Ibo. Uh, so um, please, uh, keep, uh, please keep in touch about the status of this project. Uh, I will be opening it up for uh, public uh, contributions. Uh, I, I would love to see this uh, machine learning model um, be trained to the point where it could work as a viable core for 
a high fidelity um, Pokédex. Uh, and once you're done testing um, your machine learning model, uh, you would go ahead to uh, the export. And you'll notice that there's a couple export options. Uh, so you can export into TensorFlow Lite, uh, and this is mostly for web development, but I believe you can also use TensorFlow Lite with Python. I have to double check on that. Uh, of course, you have your uh, tensorflow.js. Um, that's pretty standard uh, or part of course. Um, and what you'll get is a zipped file uh, containing a TF Lite quantized zip archive, whatever that means. Um, but you would unzip that into an assets folder within your project. Um, uh, the repo will be available, so you can also take a look at that um, after the presentation. So moving back to the slides, uh, I mentioned that there's some, there's some complex algorithms that were going on underneath the hood. Um, and I think this is the part where many people think machine learning model is, this is where data scientists, uh, this is where computer science majors and people who are geniuses and experts in the field, uh, this is what machine learning model is. This is what machine learning is. And it, you're, you're not wrong. Um, but this isn't the, but what I guess I'm trying to say is, is that you can cross small bridges and make advances forward rather than having to feel like you need to know all of these complex concepts going in. Um, and the way that this particular machine learning model works uh, is it relies actually on uh, deep learning neural networks. Um, and to explain what that means a little bit, uh, we as humans actually have more of like a simple neural network, uh, which means when we experience something, we're making connections in our brain um, between the input. There's some quick connections going on, and then there's an output. Um, and that's because we as humans have not just logic, but we have emotions and feelings and other senses as well uh, that help create more connections and stronger connections uh, and you know balance other um, perspectives around. Um, computers only really have logic. Uh, they can only really process to the ability that we can program them to understand. And so there's a lot more hidden layers. Um, to further illustrate this, uh, let's do an example. Um, so we have my cute little assistant here, Psyduck, um, and he loves candy. Um, and I know, and he's had this piece of candy he can observe that it is hard, it's pink, and it's round. And he says, oh, I like this because it tastes like strawberry. And so his confidence, the next time that he eats or that he encounters a similar candy that's still hard, pink, and round, there's a high chance that he will still like this. Now, when presented with another uh, alternative, so is this candy hard? Mm, well, it's cotton candy, so it's far from being anything but hard. Um, it's pink, which the other candies were pink, so I like I like the color. The, the the color matches my previous experiences. Is it round? Uh, it's not as round as the other candies, but it's still quite round. Um, but no, cotton candy doesn't taste like straw. This, this particular cotton candy doesn't taste like strawberry. And so his confidence level in things that are just pink will go down. So he has to rely on these other nodes, uh, the shape of it, the texture of it, the hardness of it. Uh, and maybe he's even going to bring in some additional, um, some additional uh, perspectives as well, such as what's the smell? What's the, what's the size? Um, and this is how we as humans evaluate things. Um, machine, machines, learn, machines need a little bit more layers uh, and data scientists, they tackle with those kinds of issues. Uh, and that's a little bit of a high level overview of what's kind of going on underneath the level of this image of this particular image recognition software. Uh, so next, I want to introduce you to a case study uh, actually done by some of my close colleagues. Uh, and I thought that this, this implementation of 
um, algorithmic, almost machine learning um, was quite interesting to me. Uh, and the case study is about a project called Movie Night um, done by a group from CC15. And the point that I wanna make here is that their algorithm was based on an idea, a different machine learning paradigm called weights and biases uh, in order to recommend movies to uh, their audience. Um, and so in the beginning, all the genres kind of start out about the same. Uh, there's some initial factors. There's some factors that change the weight or how much, um, how much positive influence has gone to that specific genre. Uh, some of these factors are the initial setup and configuration. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this whenever you've set up like maybe your Amazon or uh, maybe even your own Netflix account. Uh, what kind of things do you like? And there's some algorithm going on in the background and saying, hey, this particular user prefers these kinds of things. Um, until I've gotten further input, I should put more emphasis on certain things. Um, and of course, the nature of their application, normal use of the application had functions that improved and decreased the weights of certain genres. And so this is what that looks like. Um, so for a user that doesn't really watch K-dramas or doesn't really watch comedies, or maybe they just don't watch comedies and by, by association uh, through similar tags, K-dramas that are normally funny, maybe they are less likely to be recommended. Um, whereas horror, mystery, and action, genres that this particular user really liked, um, were being uh, chosen more frequently. Uh, and so in a way it's kind of machine learning, but more so on the user input and not that it's autonomously learning uh, without supervision. Um, if you thought that this was very interesting, please, I do recommend that you go to the, uh, that you follow the link at the very bottom, uh, movie night CC uh, slash movie night to see the repository. Um, I thought it was a very creative idea. Uh, and so one of the last slides I want to um, touch with you guys on now is the application of machine learning. Uh, and so this is some of the examples of machine learning in the wild uh, here in Tokyo. Um, it was just some reading that I, uh, I did um, of three companies across different industries uh, and how they utilize machine learning. Uh, the first one is Bioformis. Uh, they're in the healthcare industry uh, and they're using not just image recognition, but also 20 plus different biosensor signals uh, in order to analyze any trends with than patients uh, to preemptively treat um, any signs of deterioration or illness. Uh, the next one is cinnamon. Uh, and this one actually hits a little bit closer to home to me, uh, being a former finance analyst. Um, they're an information technology. Uh, their machine learning model processes digital data. Um, and this is not just regular digital data that's easy to read by machines. These are like PDFs. Um, and for those of you who work in accounting or accounts receivable, uh, you'll receive a lot of invoices that um, are not easily parsed by machines because they're, even if they're readable PDFs, it's just very difficult for them to find some kind of consistent pattern. But that's not stopping this specific, specific company. Uh, and the value add that that adds is that it reduces repetitive tasks. Uh, you don't have to put so much of your employment force on these tasks that could be easily um, substituted out and instead training those staff to do more specialized, more non-automatable work. Uh, and the last one is hunters.ai. And I thought this was quite interesting. Uh, they're in cybersecurity. Uh, so they're working to protect companies, um, information technology uh, and their security stacks. Um, and it uses new attack behavior to run almost kind of like a vaccine from what I understood. Uh, to find and probe weaknesses in companies' cybersecurity systems. Uh, and in return, it, it adds these reports of which areas were signs of weaknesses or possible threats. Um, and so I wanna just conclude this out because I think I'm running close on time uh, and ask the question, why did I make this? I made it because I can. Quite frankly, I made it because I can and because I think that you can. Um, 
I don't think that machine learning should be something that's locked in an ivory tower. Um, I think that being able to just use a little bit of it is available for everyone out there. Uh, and so my closing words for you are, knowing this knowledge now, uh, what will you make? Follow me on LinkedIn and GitHub. Uh, follow the project there as well. Uh, and I hope to see contributions from you guys for IBO 2.0. Have a nice day, everyone. Thank you so much, Jay. And thank you for your um, explanation using Psyduck and Candies. That was really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I really loved it. That really spoke to me. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, our next talk um, starts from 2.30. Um, so I will just um, show um, our uh, schedule of today. So just a quick reminder, um, this is uh, track B. We are also running a track A um, with um, different uh, tech talks, but of course, amazing. Um, and our next speaker, Keiza, will start his um, presentation at half past two, so in four minutes. And he will be talking about ground station as a service. So please stay tuned and we'll be back in four minutes.
Hello, hello, and we are back with our fourth talk um, today. Welcome Keizo, who is gonna talk about uh, Ground Station as a Service. Um, Keizo has grown up overseas for most of his life, and he graduated with a science degree from university in Melbourne, completing various of subjects such as biotechnology and chemistry and psychology. And right now his keen interest is cloud service and especially Amazon Web Services. So welcome Keizo. Hello. Your time, welcome, welcome, hi. <laughs> I'm giving you the stage, there you go. Okay. Hello, welcome to my presentation. Today, I'll be talking about a particular GSAS product called AWS Ground Station, which is a service that has been released by Amazon Web Services three years ago. But before I talk further in depth about it, I'd like to introduce myself and I'd like to introduce a breakdown of what this presentation will be about. My name is Keizo Hamaguchi, and I was born in Hong Kong and was raised there for about 14 years. I then relocated to Australia and lived there for another eight years. I have two hobbies. First is reading. I'm currently reading a book called The Personal MBA. And the second is gaming. I like playing this game called Rubo Universalis 4. It's a grand strategy game. So some of you might be wondering, why did I choose this topic? Actually, a year ago, I was starting to obtain a certificate from AWS, specifically the Solution Architect Associate Certificate. And while studying for that certificate, I stumbled upon AWS Ground Station. And ever since I've saw that service, it's always been in the back of my mind. And that's why I decided to choose this topic today. So here's a breakdown of my talk. Before we actually discuss what this new service from AWS is, we need to know what a Ground Station actually is. Because you know, the name Ground Station is included in AWS Ground Station. After we know what a Ground Station is, then we'll talk about what the service actually is and what it does. Later on, I'll discuss why AWS decided to make this service. Then, to get a proper understanding of how AWS Ground Station works, we need to understand some concepts and terminologies beforehand, mainly about ground stations and satellite communications, but don't worry, that's, that's pretty easy stuff. And of course, lastly, I'll talk about how the service works. So, what is a ground station? From the name alone, you can only infer it has something to do about a station on the ground, but that's quite vague. But the station serves a really important purpose in communicating with satellites thousands of kilometers away from Earth. It is responsible for sending signals to these satellites and receiving signals from these satellites. As you can see on the left image, the disc-shaped structure of those ground stations actually serve a vital role in getting the signal from the satellite. This is mainly to do with amplifying the really weak signal that arrives to the ground station from the satellite, but I digress. Well, now that we know what a ground station is, I'll discuss about AWS Ground Station. So what is it? Well, AWS Ground Station is really just a service that provides users the access to Amazon's ground stations virtually, meaning that users don't need to buy or rent their own ground stations they can just use Amazon's ground stations online. In essence, you can compare it to like virtual servers, or in the case of AWS, the Elastic Compute Cloud Service, known as EC2, which provides virtual servers to its users. In both, in both services, you don't need to own the hardware. So like in the case of AWS ground station, you don't need to own or rent the ground station. And in the case of EC2, the Elastic Compute Cloud Service, you don't need to own the server. Amazon Web, web Services provided for you. So you may be wondering, where are, the, where, are those, where are these ground stations exactly deployed? And that's a good question. Currently, Amazon has deployed ground stations across six locations in the world. I think it's in Ireland, Stockholm, Bahrain, Sydney, Ohio, and Oregon in the US. Originally, Amazon wanted to deploy ground station at across 12 locations by the end of 2019, but this wasn't achieved due to customer feedback that Amazon had obtained after engaging with their clients. 
And the feedback is mainly about locating the ground stations more to the north of Earth as possible. And this was in clash with Amazon's original deployment plan. Hence why there's only six locations in active service now. Another question you might ask is, can these ground stations contact all satellites in space? That is, how far can these ground stations send their signals to? And see, satellites in space can be categorized based on their distance from Earth. For example, low Earth orbit satellites, perhaps the closest to Earth, usually occupy between 800 to 1600 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Anyhow, that's, that's a bit out of topic, but the maximum altitude an AWS ground, ground, reason, ground station can send their signals is 12,000 kilometers away from the Earth's surface. And that's where usually medium Earth orbit satellites occupy. It's cool that Amazon Web Services provide us the ability to contact with satellites, but what use cases does this service have? Actually, why even bother contacting a satellite in the first place? Those are good questions, and I'll answer them now. I like to categorize the use cases into two sections. The first primarily has to do with communication. That is using a ground station, in this case, a ground station from Amazon to contact with other ground stations through sending a signal to a specific satellite. And then that signal would then relay those, re, uh, reflect the signals back to other ground stations. Such an example would include video broadcasting. You could potentially use AWS ground station to send video signals to a satellite and share these signals to any willing viewers. The second category involves surface imaging. That's just, it just basically, that's just basically taking a high quality image of Earth. But what can we use this image for? Well, and I think the most obvious case is weather forecasting. With these images, we can extract some weather data and analyze the data to predict weather patterns. We can also use it to predict future natural disasters, kind of similar to weather forecasting, but we can even use images obtained after natural disasters to help identify any potential survivors and assess structural damages. Lastly, and I think the most unexpected use case, is using these images for accessing, assessing business trends. Ah, there are multiple examples, including measuring the amount of cars in the parking lot, measuring the road traffic in a particular place, and measuring the amount of customers in a store or shopping mall at any time. These insights can then be can then be a benefit to businesses who may use these data to formulate better decisions. Now that we know what AWS Ground Station is and their use cases, let's talk about why it was made. If you think about it, and if you really think about it, the service doesn't cater to us normal people, nor to most software companies actually. It would really only be useful for companies or multi individuals who needs access to these ground stations. In the big picture, the service was made so that it would be more convenient for these companies or individuals to access ground stations. Let's, take, let's, let's talk further in depth as to why the service will be more used in the future. Foremost, it is a fully managed service. That means that AWS is responsible for maintaining their ground stations and users don't have to pay any maintenance fee or compensation if the ground station is damaged. Secondly, the service is convenient. I don't mean just the fact that you don't have to own or rent a ground station, but also Amazon ground stations are located near data centers responsible for hosting AWS services, like that Elastic Compute Cloud service I was talking about before. But is there any merit to that? And yes, there is. The fact that both of these infrastructures, the ground station and the data centers, are so, so placed nearby means that transferring data from a ground station to any AWS service, like that EC2, like the e, um, last few cloud virtual servers, would be really quick. In essence, it's basically about low latency. Thirdly, Amazon has ground stations all over the world, meaning that you can access ground stations from different places in the world. But is this really needed? Yes, this is due to the nature of satellite communication. What I mean by that is, in order for ground stations to communicate with satellites, the ground stations need to be able to see the satellites. So if the ground stations can't see the satellites, it cannot communicate with those satellites. This means, by, this means that by having ground stations across the world, you can always be in contact with one specific satellite if needed. Lastly, it's cheap. I 
think this is obvious, but I would also like to add the fact that this is a pay-as-you-go service. More specifically, you have to pay for every minute you use AWS Ground Station. It is cheap, but this is relative to buying or renting an actual ground station. You might be asking, this seems, to, this seems like a useful service, but are there a lot of clients willing to use this service? Like only, only space companies and again, wealthy individuals will really use this service. And the answer to that is yes. See, with growing technological advancements in the space industry in the past 20 years, smaller satellites are now able to be constructed. This means that it's more cheaper to make satellites now. Also, launching these satellites are more cheaper than before. The combination of these two factors, along with many more, has led to more space companies being formed. And these companies get access to cheaper ground stations. This is where AWS ground stations come in. Now that we understand why the service was formed in the first place, let's look at the prerequisites required to understand how AWS ground stations work. So foremost, there is specific terminologies used when transmitting signals between the ground station and the satellite. Downlinking is when the satellite relays a signal to a ground station, whereas uplinking, and I think you can already guess, is when a ground station sends a signal to the satellite. One must recall that a signal travels really long distance between the ground station and the satellite. And during that process, the signal becomes more weak. When the signal arrives at the ground station, it is, not, it is not in its original form when it was sent by the satellite. So the process of extracting the original signal from the stored signal is known as demodulation. Now we have the signal originally sent from the satellite. We must decode the signal so that when we receive whatever data is sent from, so that we can receive whatever data is sent from the satellite. All right, now that we have the prerequisites done with, let's now understand how AWS Ground Station works. To use a ground station from AWS, you need to make a reservation through their interface. This reservation process is also known as contacts. This is what a contact form will look like. In these forms, you need to fill out details pertaining to, pertaining to the usage of a ground station. This involves which ground station around the world you'll be using. And as you can see in this image here, we'll be using a ground station from Oregon. Then we need to fill out the specific satellites the ground station will be in contact with. And the next one is about the status of your form. This isn't really relevant. So this is, it just tells you whether or not the form you're filling out has, like the contact you're filling out has already been scheduled or not. Then we have the start date and time. This is when you'll be using the ground station. And lastly, the, um, the end data time. This is how long you'll be using it for so that AWS can deal you accordingly. So now, what? So now we just wait. We've, we've, we've just reserved a ground station and we just wait for it to send data? No. Way before setting up the contact form, we actually need to set up configurations on using the ground station. We firstly need to set up data flow endpoints. These are just locations, or more specifically servers, the ground station sends data to after receiving a signal from the satellites. We then need to set up configs, which is exactly as its name implies. These involve, these involve um, establishing single or multiple data flow endpoints. So that means that the ground station can send the data to like one or multiple servers. And we also need to configure the antennas during the downlinking and up, uh, uplinking process. So for, for example, um, for example, like, like uh, what, what's like the frequency of the signal uh, we need to send. Finally, we need to give a mission profile to a particular ground station. The name sounds fancy, but it's just basically choosing a specific config that you set up to be used by the ground station during the reserve time that you do use it. Now that we have successfully scheduled the, the use of a ground station, all we have to do now is extract the data given to us from a, ground, from a particular ground station. Okay, this diagram looks complex, but that's because I've copied it from an AWS blog 
about using AWS Ground Station to contact a NASA satellite, to receive an image, for, image of Earth, and using NASA software to extract from that high quality image of Earth. But nonetheless, I do think it does a great job conveying how processing data from ground stations work. Oh, look, this is what we went through in the prerequisites. The same process happens in AWS ground station. Once the ground station demodulates and decodes the signal, it needs to send the data to its data flow endpoints or the servers. However, the protocol it uses to establish establish a connection to these servers to send data is a bit unique. Let's go through it in more detail. The protocol used is called the VITA49 protocol. Once connection is established between the ground station and the data flow endpoints servers, two types of packets are sent to the data flow to the servers. One is called the signal data packet, which contains information about the, the data sent from the satellite. The other type of packet is referred to as a context packet. This contains metadata about the corresponding signal data packet. So that basically means that whenever a signal data packet is generated, a, a corresponding context packet will be generated as well. And we need this so that, and we need this context packet so that the so that the destination application or the server can process the data and the signal data packets correctly. Also, the data sent to the server are not just one of each type of packets, so not just a single uh, data, single signal data packet and its, and its corresponding context packet, but rather as a stream of packets, meaning that there are many signal data packets along with the corresponding context packets sent to the data flow endpoints. Now that we know the format of the data being sent to the data flow endpoints, can we now process the data? Not so fast. Before we do any of that, the data must go through the data defender first. Let's talk about that in more detail. So before we talk about what data defender is, I kind of I kind of just want to talk about this software itself. It's I was trying to find it very hard to find any information about the software, and that's and ultimately I found it in it. I found it like I found out that the software was made by a defense company. Anyhow, so what 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 is data vendor? It's just basically a software that must be installed in all servers to be able to effectively use AWS Ground Station. So I think you know AWS requires that you install the software, and the reason for that is that it, it ensures that all packets sent from the ground station actually arrive to the server reliably, and that no packets are lost during sending. Now that we know what Data Defender does, let's move to the next step. That is, what does this capture data capture application do? Remember that the ground station sends a stream of packets? Yeah. We can't make any use of the packets unless we combine all those packets together to form the data that was sent from the satellite. Or in the context of the diagram or the blog in the previous slide, the high quality image of Earth. But here comes in the data capture application to solve that problem. The data capture application must use either one of the following softwares to do the aforementioned job, either the front end processor or the software defined radio system. Both of these softwares sound different, but they, they're almost similar in functionality. And they, they just what they do is that they just combine these packets, they, co they combine the packets together to form the data that was sent, that was originally sent from the satellite. Well, we just covered the main components of how AWS Ground Station works. Everything else here is just extra stuff that Bob covers to extract more data from the high quality image of Earth that was given from the NASA satellite. The highlighted circles here involve using the NASA software to get more focused images. So like a particular place from the image of Earth that was given from the satellite. These are then stored to AWS, AWS storage service called S3. Then the data or images in the storage is further processed using more, AW, using more of AWS's service. So here's what I hope you learned from our presentation. What is a ground station? So it's just a station that sends a signal and receives a signal from a satellite. 
what is AWS Ground Station? It's a, it's a service from AWS that lends you access to its ground stations. Why did AWS decide to make this service? Because it's a cheaper alternative to actually owning or renting a ground station. And lastly, how AWS Ground Station works. So you might, the audience might have realized, or you might have realized, that I didn't go through how to set the service up. And there are multiple reasons why I didn't. Firstly, it's just too expensive. It costs like 10 to $20 per minute just to use the service. And secondly, I think it's a bit too time consuming. But lastly, I think the user documentation does a really great job in explaining how to set the service up. So if you're interested, please take a look. Well, that wraps everything up. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to discuss more about AWS Ground Station with me, contact me through either email or GitHub. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much again. Amazing presentation. So um, right now, um, we will take a break um, for approximately 30 minutes. Uh, so our next talk start, starts from half, uh, from, uh, excuse me, half past three. Um, so we'll be back with our next um, speakers. So our, after the break, our speakers will be Frederick talking about screen readers, Hiroki about tracing users' activity by wearable devices, and Nahoko everyday automation using Google Apps Script. So please stay tuned and we'll be back at half past three.
Hello, hello, good afternoon. And we are back with the second round of our talk, our talks. Um, our next speaker, Frederick, will be talking about screen readers. What I can say about Frederick is that his dream is to one day be able to be a part of the project that could have a positive impact on tomorrow. So welcome Frederick and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. So I would like to welcome, to welcome you, all of you guys. And um, so, as, as we said, my name is Frederick. And today we will talk about screen reader. Let me share the screen and the sound. We will meet it today. Hello. I think. Can you guys see my screen, by the way? Yes. yes, we can. Awesome. Okay, so today we're going to talk about screen reader. But before I even start talking about it, let me introduce myself. So my name is Frederick Wojcikowski. I'm from Belgium. And as you may hear from my accent, I'm from the French part of it. I'm a native French, French speaker, but I can also speak English and Japanese. I mean, I'm trying to. I arrived in Tokyo seven years ago, two days before Christmas. I wasn't able to speak Japanese at that moment, but I was very lucky because I found my very first job uh, the very next day. Uh, it was bartender. And it was a very good opportunity for me because I was able to speak with Japanese and learn the language. So talking about that, what about my background? I have absolutely no IT background before I start CC. I have been learning how to program as a hobby after work since a few years ago. It was mostly related to Android and web development. Um, yeah, people get lost watching video on YouTube, right? And I got lost doing course on Udemy, learning different things. I said lost because it's very easy to get lost, um, trying to learn new things. Um, yeah, so what made me want to learn programming at first? I used to like puzzle and logical game when I was kids, but nowadays video games are not what it used to be anymore. Now it's about shooting game, action game, and I'm not interested in that anymore. And uh, a few years ago, I discovered a new kind of logical game that I really love programming. I started learning Java and Solve Easy and Medium algorithms until I realized that programming was really powerful. I mean, so powerful that with the right knowledge and the tool, we could create anything that we could think of. And in the right hand, it can have a really big impact on all the people's life. And with that in mind, I wanted to learn even more. And yeah, that's why I'm here today. Okay, so enough about me. Let's talk about screen reader. Um, web accessibility. What is web accessibility? So let's start off. Let's start with talking about the different type of website we have out there. We have entertainment, academic, science, commerce, finance. We have so many different kind of type of uh, website. So many people use it for many different kind of things. Right? Who is using it? Adults, adolescents, kids. I mean, everyone uses it. And by everyone, I mean absolutely everyone. Even people who have disabilities. So having disability doesn't mean that they don't want to access the same content as any other user would. They want to be entertained, they want to learn, they want to know the news, right? When website and web tools are properly designed and coded, people with disability can use them. However, currently many sites and tools are developed with accessibility barrier that make them difficult or impossible for some people to use them. The web is fundamentally designed to work for all people, whatever the hardware, software, language, location, ability. When the web meets this goal, it is accessible to people with a diverse range of hearing, movement, sight, and cognitive ability. The web is very powerful. The web could remove barriers to communication and interaction that many people face in the physical world. But when website application, technology, or tools are badly designed, they can create barriers that exclude people from using them. 
accessibility is very essential for developer and organization that want to create high quality website and web tools and not excluding people from user from using their product okay so what is a screen reader by the way So a screen reader is a software that allow you allow blind people, visually impaired, or people that is having difficulty to read, to use a computer. It will speak out loud the text that is displayed on the computer screen, or the icon, the menu, dialog box, pretty much everything. And um, yeah, it will speak out loud, or it will send them uh, with a bright display, as you can see on the screen right here. And it provides access to the entire rest that it works with, including many common applications. But how does it work? A screen reader is an interface between the computer and the user. Normally, a screen reader will always start at the top of the web page or the document and read any text. The user sends command by pressing different combination of key on the computer keyboard or the braille keyboard, as I showed you earlier, to instruct the screen reader that uh, what they want to read or to do when they change the on the screen on the computer screen. A command can instruct the screen reader to read a part of the whole document, um, navigate the web page, opening and closing file, playing some music. I mean, it can do anything, actually. User may also use a spell checker in a WordPress or read the cell of a spreadsheet. If the web page are built using well structured code, then screen reader are able to interact with them very easily. Well structured web page should include a heading, list, paragraph, vision, as well as table that include relevant information about the content. Image that carry an alternative text description, link that have clear link text. All of these things should be done using the computer language um, that the web page are written in. The reason this element should be presented in the computer language code is because a screen reader will read the code of the page in making certain comments um, available. For example, when a screen reader in that file table on the, on the web page, it will look for a column in a row heading. It will, if they are present, this information is related to the user. If they are not, it will not be related to the user. In addition, a series of key commands is made available that allow the table to be navigated vertically or horizontally. Essentially, screen reader offer a command to move between list, paragraph, heading, image, link, location, table, almost every kind of element is it possible to find on a web page. Let's talk about language. A screen reader will have a primary language which match the language of the operating system. They are also capable of dealing with different language within the document. For example, if a passage of text is marked as being French, the screen reader will alter the accent, pitch, and speaking rate to mimic um, style, the style of a speaking, uh, spoken French. Most screen readers support common language, including English, French, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, and every, every different language. Mm, where does it work? Where can we use a screen reader? Well, you can use it on Linux with Oracle and SpeakUp. They're open source and free to use. On macOS, we have VoiceOver, which is by default. You don't need to install them. And when I say macOS, I also mean by that uh, iPhone. It's VoiceOver, it's free to use, and it's by default. On Windows, we have JAWS, which is the leader market at the moment for Windows. Uh, NVIDIA, that is the, the free version. It's a free to download that is open source. And ha. Okay, let's talking, uh, let's stop talking for a little bit and let the screen reader talk. You won't let me launch it here. Uh, yeah. Welcome to NVDA, welcome to NVDA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, mode presented turb. Okay, so um, I want to show you guys. Um, what can I say that? Bad example. 
So those websites are actually websites that I created when I was learning HTML and CSS um, way back, like years ago. So. Uh, Nader, Nader was exciting. I was, uh, I was still learning and I didn't actually implement um, everything or accessibility. So let me navigate through it. Sorry if I did some mistake. It's very difficult to use. A screen reader needs a lot of practice and a lot of patience. Okay. Next step, right arrow button. No, I want to go on the top, not on the bottom. Address and search bar edit has auto. Nader was exciting. Address and search bar edit has auto. HTTP, HTTPS, HTTPS, HTTP, HTTP, no. HTTP, Nader was exciting tours. Let me just get where I want to go. Heading left, graphic logo. Okay, there we are. Okay, so as you can hear, I just said that this is a graphic logo. So this is just an image, right? And I want you guys to pay attention to the floating button on the right. It's actually my navigator, my navigator floating button. Heading level one out, graphic logo, blank. Banner landmark, graphic logo, blank. As you can see, it says blank. And it's kind of weird because it's very, it's a very important button, but it's a blank. Logo. And if I push on it, it's a navigation. Uh, it's not the screen reader. It's actually me. When I call it, I didn't mention uh, to the to the source code that this floating button, this floating button is still missing some information. So the screen reader doesn't know exactly what it is. And this is a kind of bad practice. Is it something you don't want to do? Because now I can see, so I know what it is, but someone who does not see will just hear blank and will not know what it is. Another bad practice, I want to go on the bottom. And as you can see, there's a form name and for an email address main landmark edit required invalid entry has auto complete full name blank so here we know what it wants we know we need to put a full name right i want you to pay attention to the next one email address edit required invalid entry has auto complete blank so here we have the same problem that we had we had on the top uh, we have to fill that form but we don't know what it is uh, yeah, so it's really, really bad practice. And we want to make sure we, we are having placeholder and everything we need so people who cannot see and use a screen reader have every information that they need. Okay, so I want to, next, I want to show you guys uh, the language compatibility. Running application. Choose one of notification running applications. Okay. Travel agency Google Chrome. Travel agents Nadu's exciting tours for Nadu's exciting tours for adventure. Travel agent. This is, by the way, also a website that I'm creating when I was practicing flexbox. Running nota notif nv nv mm -hmm. pref prefer settings nv general nv sp speech to voice. Sp my Sorry for that. And Nvidia settings. Okay, so now um, the screen reader now we will actually start speaking in French. And uh, what I wanted to show you is that uh, so before that it was in English, and now we can do everything. We can do the same thing, but in French. Organisez votre voyage sur mesure par ici. Chez tra votre nom est Edith Blanc. So here it just said it in French, but it said that it's actually for my name. Votre email est Edith Blanc. Same thing. You just said that votre email, which is actually for my email address. So, yeah, I just wanted to show that it's also compatible in any different language, not only in English. Sheet, panel, op, and micro. And op, and travel aid. Let's go back in English. Travel agency Google. Expedia Travel, Chrome Legacy. So. After a bad example and a language example, I wanted to show you a good example. Expedia is a very, very, very good website. It's been coded with uh, accessibility, and it's very amazing how good it is. 
even though I still have difficulty to use this on the video itself, but you know, just a matter of practice. Okay, so let's do something. Let's kind of make a reservation. Let's say that we are in Tokyo and we want to go back in, in Belgium. Address and search bar edit. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to press that button. Expedia travel, skip to main content one of one. So now it says that, okay, what you just, what you just see here is the button that it's not supposed to be there. It just appeared because I have a screen reader and it's letting me know that I can skip to the main content because I'm not supposed to be able to see. And I don't want to go into every single detail of the page. So I can like jump right into where I want to go. So let's skip everything to the main content. Expedia travel, vacation homes, hotels, car rentals, flights, and more document. So here I'll just tell me that the navigation bar having a state like car, vacation, all of that. So I would just push the tab button and navigate into it and make my reservation. Main landmark, figure, tab control, stays tab selected one of six, flights tab two of six. Hmm, that's the one I want. Let's push enter. Selected. So now I'm going to go through that tab. No next radio button. It's not the one on it. Clickable one traveler button collapsed. Okay, I'm gonna be the only one traveling, so let's leave it like that. Clickable preferred flight class economy button collapsed. Hmm. Yeah, I want the economy. Clickable leaving from button. So now I need to enter where I'm leaving from. I'm gonna push enter. Leaving from edit. Where are you leaving from? Okay. Blank. Leaving from search open. Enter search term. So now I'm leaving from Narita, so I'm just going to put the NRT, which is the shortcut from Narita. T, N, R, T, 10 results are available for your convenience. Use the arrow keys to navigate the list. N, R, T, 3 results are available for your convenience. Use the arrow keys to navigate the list. Okay, so it just told me that I have three, um, three results, and uh, I can navigate with the arrow. Through the results. That's what I'm going to do. NRT, Tokyo, NRT, Narita, INTL. This is exactly where I'm, where, where I'm flying from. So I'm going to push it. You selected Tokyo. Yeah. Tab. Clickable main land, clickable going to button. So here I'm going to do exactly the same thing, but this time for Brookside. Going to edit where Y, Y, U, B, R, U10 results are available for your convenience. Use the arrow keys to navigate the list. Brew, Brussels, Brew Brussels National. You selected Brussels, Brew Brussels National. Clickable main landmark figure departing March 13th. Date picker opened. Select a date. Okay, so let's say that I'm, I want to fly next week. Well, and Edit the check-in date in the tables below. Sud. Friday column 6, March 6, 2021. Uh, $847 button. Travel a task bar, date and time, tray input indicator English, United. Okay, so next week it's actually the 6. I was actually checking, I wasn't sure when it was. Uh, so, uh, let's go back. Sat, sat Expedia travel. Okay, so I say next week. So next week is Saturday 6. Sun, but. Next, table with six rows and seven, columns row two. Friday column six, March 6th, 2021. $847 button. Okay, so that sounds great. I want that one. Saturday, March 6th, 2021 selected. Now choose a checkout date. So I know I'm going to want, I want to go back home next week. So I'm just going to push that seven time because seven days, right? So one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven. Saturday, column 7, March 13th, 2021. Saturday, March 13th, 2021, selected. Okay, so when I select those dates, uh, yeah, there's a shortcut to actually go on the done button that I'm not really sure what is the shortcut. Is. So I'm just going to use the mouse. Sorry for that. And push it. Done. Done, save changes and close the date picker. But Search button. I'm just going to do the search. Flight search. 
page header banner landmark menu menu item skip to main content out of menu okay so now here it's kind of this page is kind of complex right i don't want to navigate to every single element i want to go straight to to the result so i'm just going to use the header so the header so i'm just going to push h until i reach my my result clickable page change your search complementary land departure time in took arrival time in brussels heading level main landmark select your search results heading level two okay search result that sounds what i want i'm just going to pick that from there list with 18 items select and show fair information for qatar airways flight departing at 10 35 p not support 10 35 that's some way that's the one i want so i'm just going to push enter Close flight details Tokyo to Brussels Qatar Airways bullet Saturday March. And then and from there, you know, you, you kind of understand the way of us minute is working. And then from there, I just can go to the continue button. Or I can just keep reading every detail that I want. And uh and then I would need to enter baggage my fees credit card information. Uh I would not do that because I don't actually really want to make a reservation. It was just for the demonstration purpose. So Let's Mail. Notific. I would just turn off the screen reader for now. Notific. NV. NV. X. NVD. OK. Okay. okay. Back where it was supposed to be. Okay. So that is that is what's for the demo. So, what do we need to remember from from that demo? We need to remember that not everyone can see or can hear. Some people have disability. And while creating app, while creating website, we don't we don't want to create barrier. We want everyone, as I said earlier, everyone to be able to access our web page. Right? I want you guys to have empathy and learn the accessibility technology. Because through our code, we have the power to make everything accessible. And I wanted to finish on this quote from Denzel Washington that says. The most selfish thing you can ever do in this world is helping someone else because of the good feeling of helping, helping others. Nothing's better than that. So please be very, very, very selfish through your code. Okay? And I want to thank you guys for having time to listen to me. My name is Frederick. You can see all my information here, my mail. My LinkedIn, if you want to add me. My Facebook, if you want to add me as well. Why not? And that was it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Frederick. Thank you for reminding us that um, technology should be accessible to everyone. That is a very important message. Thank you so much. Um, so our next talk will start in seven minutes and um, our next speaker, his name is Hiroki, and he will be talking about tracing users activity by wearable devices. Um, we'll be back in seven minutes with another talk.
Welcome back, everyone. Hiroki is already with us. Um, welcome our next speaker. Hiroki graduated from University of Tokyo and he became a doctor and works as a psychiatrist um, in Tokyo. Now he's studying engineering at Code Chrysalis at our bootcamp in order to become a full stack engineer and create applications for psychiatry. And with those applications, he wants to improve people's mental health. Welcome Hiroki and the stage is yours. Hello, I'm so thank you for, 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 for introducing. So, so let's share my presentation. So, so now. Uh, so hello, so I'm Hiroki Otani. So I'm, so I'm grateful for presenting my tech talk. So, so, so today, so I'm introducing that kind of medical information a smart, a smart watches can track. So, uh, so first of all, uh, please let me so in, introduce, introduce myself. So I was born in Kyoto, and uh, live for uh, about twenty about twenty so long years. I was I was graduated from medical school in the University of Tokyo. Can become a doctor now. I work as a psychiatrist as a psychiatrist so in this in this hospital so in Tokyo. So I'm interested in engineering for psych for psychiatry. So now I participated in code in code code crisis code crisis boot boot camp and want to become a medical engineer. So then let me introduce my presentation. So my theme is about smartwatch application in medicine. Why is smartwatch application important in medicine? And that's because a smartwatch can directly measure human, human medical state and uh, activity. So not only in, in, so in hospital, but uh, also so in daily life for the first time in human history, I guess. So it is a, it is a revolutionary change in medical science. So now I'm talking about what information smart watches can track. And I'm introducing our application of it in medical science. So, so state the smart watches can track so many kind of kind of kind of information. So, so most use most useful measure studying instrument in smart watches may be accelerometer. So, so it can measure uh, 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 to of watches. So that's lead to tracking activity of arms such as eating, drinking, take, taking gestures, so even walking. So this sensor can track human activity <clears throat> that, um, 
So, can track human activity directly? So, if application is able to analyze big data of it. So, I will introduce such kind of example in the next slide. And another important sensor is GPS. So it can measure users moving in bump. That's very important. So because it can see, see how users live in daily, in daily life. So however, that is an issue about users' privacy. So, so now I introduce the application shown example example which use accelerometer. So this research was published last year. So this research is the is the coordination of smoke, of smoke gestures using smart watch, te, smart watch technology. So in this research, accelerometer in smart watch try to check smoking gestures. So, so, so this image Show, show three lines. They refer to three, three dimensional, dimensional relations. So, so X and Y and Z. So, this deviation and degradation of three lines in the smoking gesture. So, this application analyzes. These data with, with artificial neural networks and can identify so whether user is smoking or not. It's high accuracy. So in my opinion, as a psychiatrist, so it, so it is very, very so important. Uh, I did decrease the smoker patient sometimes hit on the fact they smoke, they smoke, they smoke secretly. So even if they want to stop smoking, them, smoking them themselves. So this application can help users prevent from smoking by checking whether they smoke or not. Now, I'm introducing heart rate sensor. It can track not only heart state, but also the stress by checking, checking sympathetic, dom sympathetic dominance, uh, because uh, stress can raise heart rate. So, and, and, and so ECG, electrocardiography can track heart state. More correctly. There are many reports that the sensors save the life. And oxygen saturation is a vital information too. It can detect whether user can breathe smoothly or not. It can save user's life too. <coughs> so I introduced this famous big, big study, so Apple Heart, Apple Heart, Heart so study. So this study insists Apple Watch can detect atrial fibrillation, which is one kind of Arrhythmia. So, this is a fatal heart disease causing death. So, couple watch track ECG so information and analyze these data. Uh, so, I don't know how to analyze it. So, it, it may be secret, but I guess machine learning may be used. Uh, so, needless to say, 
it is very important to detect at a, at a real fibrillation as because if this app catch a, a, a real fibrillation and inform it of the user's hospital, it can save the save user's life. So, so now introduce another the application which use heart rate and other sensors. So this research is published last year. So it insists on tracking by smartwatch make it possible to detect COVID-19 before any symptoms, as, such as cough, fever, diarrhea. Mm. So this application <coughs> check heart rate and check user steps and sleep to, to supplementary. So this image show how this, this application check these informations. So heart rate and steps and sleep. So in analyze create two index, uh, so resting heart, heart rate difference and heart rate over steps, anomaly detection, which means this application check, check heart rate changes in both situation of, the, of this situation and Situation. situations. So these graph shows about a week, about a week before before symptoms were set. So so we the symptoms symptoms were set. And there are deviation of these indexes and which means Elevation of heart rate in this situation and active situations. And these pre, pre symptomatic detection are very, very useful for, for preventing pandemic. Also, because people who have COVID 19 virus can avoid avoid the infecting other people. So even before they got the symptoms and avoid contact. So I will introduce next the example of application. So, so emotion, emotion recognitions. So, this research was published in 2018. It insists a smartwatch can detect the user's emotions. So this application tracks heart rate and analyze this data with future extraction and sliding windows. Uh, this is one kind of machine learning. So this application can detect whether emotion user have happy emotion, sad emotion, and neutral emotions. There is only three kind of kind of emotions. So, but even even if so, so it, it is important to detect specific specific emotions. Also because these emotions to reflect the quality of life. <coughs> so <coughs> we go back to what, what information what can track. So by your impedance, measure the electric resistance of your skin. So it can measure body composition such as fat, muscle, minerals, and water. So that leads to detect 
body fluid shift, uh, such as um, dehydration. Uh, dehydration can cause human death. So, um, this uh, application using this sensor can save life. Can save life too. And so next, electrodermal activity, so which means electronic character. Character of skin, sorry. So it will to check, especially so amount of sweat in skin. So it can detect user user stress and so de and dehydration. So and of course, uh, so smartwatch can measure user's body the body temperature. So needless to say, so body temperature is very important information, can be used for detecting to inf to inf to infections. So, so let's <coughs> so introduce last example of application. So this research is a bit old, but so very so intimate. So interesting. It was published in 2017. So it insists smartwatch can detect users' mental stress. So this application track users' heart rate, galvanic, galvanic skin response, which is the same of electrodermal activity and body temperature. And then analyze this data with K genuine classifier, which is one kind of one kind of machine learning. So, so, so this picture shows the mean of carbonic skin response as so its peak, which is related to, to the Amount of sweat. Mm. So this index is the most useful, the most useful for detecting mental stress. So this example is very important. So because even mental status, which seems to be difficult to check by devices, can be checked by smartwatches. So it insists smartwatch application for psychiatry, it has a great potential, so I think. So we go back, go back to introduce other information which it can track. Uh, so smartwatch can track so many kind of, kind of, kind of information like here. Uh, so, 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 Proximity is sensor whether you are near the watch or not. And smartwatches can have a compass altimeter, gyroscope, magnetometer, and, and UV sensor. Now, it may be difficult to get medical status from this kind of information, but in the future, there may be applications which use this kind of information, so I think. So that's bring me to the end of the, of the presentation. So finally, I gave my three conclusions. One, so VR devices can track so many kind of human activity and state. And so two, uh, tracking these activity can make so many so many kind of benefits, uh, such as uh, so preventing preventing smoking, uh, detecting COVID nineteen before symptoms, so detecting even even mental stress. 
Uh, so three. So in my in my knowledge, uh, most of the tracking uh, application use some kind of, of machine learning. The tracking data is is very big. So analyzing this data with machine learning is so important. So if you try to create the application of smartwatches, which track some information of the information of users, using machine learning may be needed, may be needed. So my presentation is ended. Uh, so, so here my GitHub account. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Hiroki, for your amazing presentation. So our next um, presentation um, will start from half past four. And our next speaker, um, her name is Nahoko, and she will be talking about everyday automation using Google Apps Script. So we'll be back with this talk in approximately nine minutes.
Hello, hello, and we are back with our last talk of today. Um, Nahoko. Welcome, Nahoko, our next uh, wonderful speaker. Nahoko is a um, cross-cultural communication specialist with experience in tech industry. And now she's learning coding at Code Chrysalis to explore how developing tech um, literacy will impact her life and perspective. Welcome, Nahoko, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Ang. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, let me... When you're ready, I can start sharing my screen. Great. So I think we are ready. Hi everyone, my name is Nahoko and thank you for tuning in today. Let me start my presentation with a couple of questions. One, do you use Google Apps such as Google Drive, Google Sheets, Google Slides, Forms, or Calendar perhaps? If you are watching this talk, I assume that the answer is yes for most of us. Second question, have you used Google Apps Scripts? To this one, you may say, no, I haven't used it. Or some even say, like, Google Apps what? And that's actually perfect. Through this presentation, we will have fun discovering what is Google Apps Script and why they are so great and when and how we can start using it. But before diving into the topic, let me share a little story about me. My bad. So let me start sharing my story about me, passion, and coding. I know either you know you're not here to get to know me or seeking another motivational speech. I'll keep this nice and short and promise it, it has something to do with the topic. With that said, don't you feel that these days, you know, everyone talks about follow your passion or building your career around what you are naturally passionate about? And do you completely agree with this idea or are you a little skeptical? Growing up, I was naturally gravitated towards foreign countries, cultures, and languages. One may call it a, my passion. And in my adult life, I have lived and worked in different countries, such as New Zealand, Canada, Mexico, and Australia. And I did a fair amount of traveling as well. When I was a teen teenager, I told my parents one day I want to travel to foreign countries or even asked, can I study abroad? Their response, well, why abroad? Um, you know, it's expensive, it's dangerous, Japan has everything you need and more. Why don't you just travel to hot springs in Japan? You know, they are great parents, I love them so much, but when it comes to my passion, they just didn't get it. The great thing about passion though, um, is that you don't really care about what others think. You know, as soon as I got into a university in Japan, I started to working and save some money and off I went. So at 19, I took my first, very first airplane ever and lived in New Zealand for one year. And that was an amazing experience. So in college, I studied about language and culture, cultural diversity, and also minored in Spanish language. After graduation, I started out as corporate interpreter in English, Spanish, and Japanese. Then my passion evolved into how people collaborate across cultures, and I transitioned into human resources it was so much fun, actually, uh, leading projects, um, 
you know, with people from different cultural backgrounds, create new training programs, onboarding new employees from different backgrounds, promote diversity and inclusion, and also optimize compensation and benefit systems. And prior to joining Code of Criticize, I was working independently in areas such as communication, training, and e-learning localization. So looking back, I can say that I have built my career around my passion, and it's been awesome. But this same follow your passion narrative has been blocking me for years too. These years, I have been curious about coding and was wondering if I should start learning. But when I hear programmers or software engineers in general talk about why they started coding, they say something along the lines of, you know, I have always loved video games or my parents got me a computer when I was 10 and I immediately got into it. Or I was naturally really good at math, well, which never happened to me. Me, I was more like a playing sports, enjoying art or talking with people kind of kid, you know, including people from different countries and cultures. I thought, well, I don't relate to their stories and coding may not be for me. Things changed when I was working with tech companies or and startup related organizations as a freelancer. They made me realize that computer, email, or even phone with camera, funny enough, used to be for a very specific group of people. They were called like geeks or techies. And there were people who decided at one point that I would not use a computer or you know, those gadgets, they are for younger people, not me. But now, if you look at those things, you know that these tools are a commodity and everyone uses them except for those who decided not to. Then I thought maybe um, programming literacy is following the same path. And I asked myself, do I want to be one of those people who reject technology and the change in general? Or should I expose myself to the unknown? So if coding is becoming to be for all, how can a person like me, who is not necessarily naturally passionate about it, start developing passion for coding? That is a question I had in my mind when I finally started learning to code last October. The same question led me to code the Chrysalis Immersive Program this year. And this is the reason why I chose this topic, Google Apps Scripts, for my tech talk today. Because I believe Google Apps Script is a great place to start if you are curious about coding and what it can do for you and for people around you. Let me explain why. I don't know about you, but I'm in my mid-30s and experienced this change firsthand. We used to be surrounded by many physical tools and one by one, they turned into apps in our computer or mobile. And today, there are apps for everyone, everything, and every purpose, really, and we use them every day. Personally, I use a lot of Google apps every day. Do you use these apps too? Google Drive, Slides, Sheets, Spreadsheets, Docs, Forms, Google Calendar, Google Map, Google Chrome Search, Google Translate, or even YouTube. For the next 15 or 20 minutes or so, I will talk about how we can tailor Google Apps functionality to our needs using this, this thing called Google Apps Script. And you should come along if you use Google Apps frequently. You like the idea of automating repetitive, error-prone, manual tasks you know basic JavaScript 
or at least willing to learn a little bit. Or just simply you are looking for something new or interesting that might improve your quality of life. So in the first part of our presentation, we will learn what is Google Apps Script, why learning it a little bit is better than not learning at all. How can we start using it? I'll walk you through a demo to update a Google Slides presentation with data from Google Sheets and explain the actual code and where to write the code. Don't worry, it's not too complicated. And in the end, I will share three concrete ideas for everyday automation with the hope to inspire you to implement your own project. Sounds good? Okay, let's jump in. First thing first, what is Google Apps Script? It is a rapid application development platform developed and pro provided by Google that makes it fast and easy to create business applications that integrate very well with Google Workspace. There are three reasons why this language is a great place to start coding. My bad. Going into the first reason. The first reason is that it is beginner friendly and a powerful tool for automation. For example, this person started learning to automate his Google Sheets and ended up getting a job as a front-end engineer. It is friendly enough for coding beginners like us to get started. Sometimes all you need is you know, about 10 lines of code. Learning it a little bit opens up so much opportunity for everyday automation. Also, there are people who make their full-time business even out of projects using Google Apps Script. It is powerful enough for experts to have a specialized business. Advanced users can help companies automate their marketing research, analytics, etc. Second reason is that it's completely free. You all you need is a Google account. Well, are you convinced yet? Well, there are more reasons. For me, the biggest reason was this. Google Apps Script is readily available, meaning code editors is in the browser, so you don't have to install anything. It runs on Google's server. As a beginner, it is such a relief that you don't have to set up a server yourself. And if you know basic JavaScript, it is easy to learn Google Apps Script. In other words, if you learn Google Apps Script, it will be easy for you later on to learn JavaScript as well. JavaScript, by the way, is one of the most popular programming languages today. By now, you may say, well, I like it. Now show me a demo. But wait, there's one more thing, and it's important. We are all busy and the idea of learning it by yourself from scratch may sound daunting for some of us. Google is one of the best companies in the world and they know what we need very well. They provide an ample library where we can find sample cores. We can just start by copy and pasting them. And if you are a business visual learner, you can go to Google, or no, you can go to YouTube, or you can go to Google as well, but you can directly go to YouTube and to find the video tutorials with, some, with these hashtags. And of course, full documentation is available whenever you feel ready to learn a little more. All right, so you should be convinced by now that Google Apps Script is something you want to know more about. Next. I will walk you through a demo so you can see when and how you can start using it. The first question, do you make presentations at work or in school if you are a student? If not, 
Well, for now, uh, imagine that you are working for a company and you often give presentations about your business. When I was working in human resources, when we onboard new employees, a company intro presentation often looked something like this. Uh, new employees, our, our businesses based in this many countries, uh, we have this many businesses and this many users and our employee number is this and that. You know, new employees should all know this by the time they join the company, but hey, it's good to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And if you work in an app development team, your presentation may look more like this. You know, last month, the app was downloaded this many times, there were this many users, total revenue is this amount, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea, right? Okay. You can see that there are key numbers and metrics sprinkled all over the presentation deck and you need to update them constantly. The problem was, for me at least, was that I often forget to update either a few of them or sometimes all of them and ended up correcting them on the spot. I can tell you that was uh, no fun or it didn't look too professional. So what if we use Google Apps Script in this scenario? How can it help us make sure that we update all of the metrics in the presentation deck and do it quickly? Let me show you step-by-step step through this demo. First, what you need to do is to jot down all the metrics that need constant updates in one single Google spreadsheet, like this. The column A has descriptions and column B is where you update the numbers. Easy, right? Next, prepare template slides. Something like this. Instead of the actual numbers, you use tags like this one with the matrix descriptions. Now pay attention because this is where it gets more interesting. Here, go to tools and you see the script editor. Let's click and open it. If you click and open it, you see something like this. And I have my code already here, prepared. And if you look at the code first, get ID. First of all, you know that each Google Drive uh, document has it is own uh, ID. And first, get ID of the slide deck template that we already saw and the spreadsheet in the first two lines. And make a copy of the slide deck template specifying the name that's here. And next lines, open spreadsheet and newly created copy by their own ID, right? And next, get the metric descriptions and numbers from the spreadsheet in one line, very easy. And here, if you know basic JavaScript, through this whole loop, you can replace all the tags in the new, newly created deck with their latest numbers. So if you run this code, ah, but before going there, in sidebar, there are additional resources as well. If you click on services, well, you see a list of services. For example, analytics reporting API. We will talk about it later, but for now, that is all. Now let's close this and let's click run. Execution has been started. And looks like now it's complete. 
Let's open up the new copy and see how it looks like. Ta-da! All the tags in all slides, like this is one, this is two. They are all updated. It's pretty handy, right? Um, when we are dealing with you know, this kind of multiple tasks day in, day out, Having these tricks in place really increases our productivity. And more importantly, help us create more space for the work that actually matters. Now, let's move on and discover more use cases. Let me switch back to the presentation. All right. So what more can we do? To be honest, there is no end to this question. As I told you, while Google Apps Script can be really simple and beginner friendly, it can do a magic, especially when you use it with a variety of API services and libraries. Here, I will briefly share three concrete ways we can use Google Apps Script in the real world. Uh, quite honestly, the examples I wish I had known earlier. Although this may not directly apply to your own situations or problems, you will have a better idea how versatile Google Apps Script can be. Okay, let's go. So, first idea that I want to share is to create emails using a Google template and data from Google Spreadsheet, and also send it, send them automatically. Have you ever sent a similar email to multiple clients? Well, if so, if you have, how did you do it? If you are like me, you probably first prepare a list of clients, write down your email message, your email message to the first client on the list, send the email, then use the sent email as a template, change parts of the email with the information you want to share with the second client on the list, change the address to the second client's email address, and again, hit the send button. But only then you realize that the subject line of the email that you just sent to the second client actually mentions the name of the first client. Sounds familiar? Well, if you don't know what I'm talking about, I really need a, some kind of like recapture to confirm that if, if you are not a robot. It is terrifying to make this kind of mistake, but hey, it, who wants to write almost the same email over and over again? So, if you remember what we saw in the demo, actually you can imagine how Google Apps Script can come rescue. First, open your Gmail and create a draft message with tags in it, just like the slide that we saw. Next, create a Google spreadsheet, list all the clients in the first column, email address, et cetera, et cetera. Then, then, you can go to Google's code library and copy and paste the code that creates a menu called Mail Marsh. Finally, run the script in the same way. And this will not only create email messages with data from spreadsheet, but also automatically send them for you. Pretty cool, isn't it? Here's more advanced use case. Almost any business today has some kind of online presence. And how do you measure if your online marketing strategy is working? Well, one of the most popular ways is to use Google Analytics. This means that quite possibly someone in the company is generating a report using data from Google Analytics. I used to be that person and it's a lot of work. You have to retrieve the data and manually fix the format, et cetera, et cetera. It's a lot of work. Now you know how it rolls. Yes, this whole process could have been automated using Google Apps Scripts. Remember the Google Analytics API that we saw in the demo? For this task, you can enable it and set it up to get data and process it accordingly in the Google Sheets. 
You can even set this code to run periodically, like weekly, monthly, etc. And here's the last one. Have you heard of email marketing? Well, often when you go to a website, they ask you to subscribe to a newsletter or something, or leave your contact e information in exchange of some sort of a freebie. And you ask, and you answer some questions too, such as which of the following topics you are interested in, etc. This is pretty popular. Then what happens? The company may follow up on you by email, providing more free resources, or inviting you to their future events. And big companies have their fancy sales automation systems, but more and more new and small companies are using Google Apps. And can you think of what Google Apps script we can use to automate this process? Right. Prospect data can be retrieved from Google Forms to Google Sheets, then send customized email by sending information from Google Sheets to Gmail. The invitations to future events? Well, why not sending them directly to the calendar of the prospect? You do not need any fancy CRM system to automate this. It's free. When I learned about this, it really blew my mind. And I hope you are too uh, inspired to explore more about Google Apps Script. Okay, let's wrap things up. In this presentation, we learned what is Google Apps Script and why learning it a little bit is better than not learning at all. How can we start using it? We did a demo and also explain the code implementation and script editor. In the end, I shared three concrete ideas for everyday automation with the hope to inspire you to implement your own project. So if you want to start learning to code or apply your basic JavaScript knowledge in the real world, Google Apps Script is a great place to start. Yeah, resources, but of course, you don't need to take a note. You just can Google them. Oh, one last thing. Remember that my parents didn't get my passion for traveling abroad? A couple of years ago, my mom, actually before the pandemic, my mom got her first passport and traveled abroad for the first time at the age of 60. And you know what? She really loves it. Uh, now she's waiting for the pandemic to be over so she can travel to other countries again. So it's never too late. You can change your opinion anytime and start developing your new passion at any age. Okay, so thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or if you want the link to this presentation, feel free to contact me by LinkedIn. My name is Nahoko Toyota. And looking forward to hearing about your cool automation projects sometime in the future. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Nahoko. That was really wonderful. It's so useful in everyday life. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet. <laughs> yes. And also, I wish that your mom will be able to travel again soon since she's passionate about it right now. <laughs> she's counting the days. Yeah. <laughs> I think all of us do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you do. so much. Thank, Thank you, you for the presentation. Bye. And bye. And before we um, finish, uh, I would like to share one last uh, information. So, this is, this is the end of our tech. Uh, tech talks today uh, but um, if you liked it and if you got inspired by our uh, speakers and their talks if you got very interested in uh, some uh, technologies that they were talking about then please stay tuned for our demo day which is going to happen in next month March 25th what is demo day demo day is the even when we um, share the final presentations, actually not we, our, our wonderful immersive students share their final presentations. They talk about the technology behind the applications uh, they built. They share their knowledge and their passion. So please um, stay tuned for that event and I hope to see you there. Bye.